Um, hello, my name is Natalie Grohmann and I'm the active travel policy lead in the Welsh Government. Together with my, Ian, uh, with my colleague Ian Bradfield, um, I will set out some of the things that we are doing in Wales to improve conditions for cycling and walking. So I will start off with a brief look at the situation um, for cyclists in Wales today and uh, with a view on the uh, topic of the, the seminar series, uh, I'm, I'll be looking particularly at safety. And um, I will then explain how we are trying to change this through the active travel legislation that we passed and the wider measures to support it. And in the second part of the presentation, my colleague Ian will then speak about our plans to introduce the default 20 mile per hour speed limit and um, where people live to make sure that Wales becomes less car dominated and more geared up towards the needs of the people who are living there. So let's briefly look at the current situation for cycling in Wales. The Welsh, uh, <clears throat> Welsh government recognises the huge and wide ranging benefits of walking and cycling and it is our aim to make walking and cycling basically the sort of most natural choice for shorter journeys. However, we are starting from a very low baseline. So when we look at the figures for 2018-19, only 6% of adults actually made at least one cycling trip as, as um, a mode of transport per week. And this figure is significantly higher for men than for women. And less than half of children traveled actively to primary school and only a third to secondary school. And I think strikingly, only 4% of those aged over 60 cycled at least once a month. And we know from other countries that um, uh, age is no barrier to cycling. And this is something that we would love to change and hope that things like e-bikes can really help us with that in the future. So what are the barriers? When we ask people why they are not cycling, the answers can be broadly classed into three categories. And um, the first one of those is basically safety or the perceptions of safety, which are closely interlinked. And then practicality and the perceptions of practicality. And with that, we're thinking of things like the trip length, topography, weather, um, trip chaining, transporting people or things. And the third category is maybe a bit harder to pin down, but it's a sort of um, um, lack of a cycle culture or the image that cycling is simply not seen as something that people would consider themselves doing. And um, these factors are obviously not unique to Wales and they're also not uniform all over the country. There are definitely areas where these are less important than elsewhere. But um, none of the less, they are really big um, factors in why people don't cycle more. And we can't do something about all of these barriers, obviously. So we won't be able to change the weather or the topography, although with um, the right clothing and e-bikes, I mean, obviously these aren't necessarily something that can't be overcome either. But importantly, we can tackle safety and to some degree we can track, uh, tackle practicality. So I think in the next few slides, um, I want to first look at the situation of how safe or unsafe cycling currently is, and then look at what we're doing to improve it. So in 2018, there were 417 pedal cycle casualties, and this represents just over 7% of all casualties in Wales, and 103 of these were fatally or seriously wounded. And I think these numbers only really make sense when we look at them in context. So per billion vehicle kilometres, it means that cyclists were 14 times more likely to become a casualty and 25 more likely to be actually seriously killed or uh, seriously injured or killed than the car or taxi occupants. And that, of course, is a huge, um, hugely higher risk. And this is something that we definitely need to change. So when we look at the long-term trend, we can see that whilst 
cycle casualties, uh, casualties have been reducing. Actually, over the last 12 years, there has been very little substantial um, change. And in particular for the um, more serious injuries, killed or seriously injured, um, since the early 90s, there hasn't really been a great change. And when we look at who the people are who are getting particularly um, injured or who are getting injured, we can see that male, males dominate across all age groups and particularly um, in the middle age, there's um, a very high proportion. And we can also see that for children, or we know that for children, the trend has been decreasing and for older people, it's been increasing. But these figures are probably a reflection of the differential le uh, levels and trends in cycling. And we're keen to gather more data to help us understand these better. So when we look at when casualties occur, we can see that the highest number of cyclists get injured on weekdays and in the morning and afternoon peak. And this reflects higher levels of traffic, obviously, but also suggests that a lot of casualties occur on utility journeys, not on leisure rides, which might sometimes anecdotally be assumed. So like analysis elsewhere has shown, um, junctions are particularly dangerous. So 66% of um, our cyclist casualties in Wales occur at junctions and nearly three quarters occur on 30 mile per hour roads. So as I said, we want to improve our understanding of the data and we will be able to draw on better contextual data for these kind of casualty figures when we restart our national travel survey for Wales in the near future to get more information on what types of journeys people make, how long they are, purposes are. So in summary then, I think while serious and fatal injuries are relatively rare, um, as we want to increase levels of cycling, we clearly need to um, improve cycle safety both objectively and subjectively, uh, subjectively further so that um, people feel safe to get on their bike. So how do we move from a situation where this picture um, basically represents the reality of the journey to school for many children and where cycles are seen essentially as exercise equipment by most people to a situation where the majority of children walk, school, skip or cycle to school and all sorts of people use cycles for all sorts of purposes. So, the foundation for changing the situation um, was laid by making a short but important piece of legislation in 2013 with our Active Travel Act. And the Act aims to increase walking and cycling levels for journeys with a purpose. So it specifically does not consider recreational walking and cycling. And in, that is in order to help basically our public policy to focus on enabling journeys that people need to make every day. We have been investing in active travel routes for many years, but this has resulted in very piecemeal, disjointed and quite often outdated infrastructure. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with signs as these on the, um, on the slide. So in order to change this problem and to address this problem, a key provision of the Active Travel Act is that all local authorities in Wales need to plan coherent active travel route networks for all of their main towns and large villages. And that is essentially all the places with a population over 2000 people. And it's not limited to those places, they can plan for more, but this is the minimum they need to do. These plans will in the future be known as active travel network maps. Um, the first stage basically in compiling these maps was to capture the baseline. So basically uh, local authorities had to assess and show all their existing walking and cycling routes and identify if and to which extent they are already suitable for active travel journeys. And that was based on huge survey and audit work. And then the second stage is then to develop integrated network plans showing the network of routes that should be developed over the next 15 years. And both of these stages need to be refreshed, refreshed every three years. The next submission is actually due at the end of this year and our local authorities are very busy working on these plans at the moment. So 
So beyond planning the network, the Act also compels local authorities to make improvements to their networks, networks each year and to report on these improvements. So that is basically moving from the relatively um, small existing network and making steps towards the planned network. And importantly, local authorities, as well as the Welsh Government itself, must enhance provision for walking and cycling in, in so far as possible whenever they construct or improve highways. So it's not just those that are identified by the routes, but actually anything they do needs to, um, needs to factor in how conditions for walkers and cyclists can be improved. And that is something that um, I think is really important to bear in mind. And that's why we need to reach more people um, when, we, when we talk about active travel. Um, and walkers and cyclists need, also need to be considered when making any traffic management arrangements. So no longer um, just a simple um, oh, footway closed and you're left as a, um, as a pedestrian to work out where you need to go in roadworks, but actually a diversion has to be identified and has to be made safe as well. So um, a further important duty is that local authorities need to promote active travel. Um, and that is a duty not just on the transport um, function of the local authority, but on the whole local authority. So we are encouraging um, our colleagues uh, to work much more closely with other departments, particular housing, health, education, environment, to help meet those duties. And finally, they need to report on how they're doing on this. So the provisions of the Active Travel Act are now embedded within a really strong wider framework that supports our aim of getting more people walking and cycling. And this framework includes the adoption of a sustainable transport hierarchy across the Welsh Government, the strengthening of how we deliver infrastructure, an emphasis on engagement and consultation, increased levels of funding, and a clear alignment um, of priorities and objectives that reaches far beyond the transport sector. And I will say a little bit more about each of these in the next few slides. So our new Wales transport strategy was published earlier this year, and it quite radically has the sustainable trans uh, transport hierarchy at its core. So it's prioritizing walking and cycling uh, um, above tra public transport, above um, private modes of transport. And it sets um, us a very ambitious target of increasing the sustainable mode share so, or trip the percentage of trips made by sustainable modes to 45% by 2040. And that is on the basis of a current estimate of 32% at the moment. So this has already resulted in the announcement last week that we will pause work on all new road schemes that are not already in construction to allow a full review of the um, construction program to go ahead. So find the infrastructure. We know that infrastructure that is safe and well-designed is key to many people's confidence in promoting journeys by active modes. And we are focusing our efforts on raising the standards of the infrastructure built in Wales hugely. So we are publishing our updated Active Travel Act guidance <coughs> next month, we hope. And the guidance is a comprehensive guide to planning and designing walking and cycling infrastructure. All schemes receiving uh, funding from the Welsh Government need to comply with it. And the design guidance aims for the highest standard active travel for active travel infrastructure, but it also provides options where this is not possible. I think we have all seen images of completely segregated, generously proportioned cycling networks, such as these um, shown on these pictures. But of course, the reality in many places is very different. And so the aim is to support local planners and designers to find suitable solutions, even in those circumstances where it's not possible to have the perfect um, segregated infrastructure through innovative ways. And whilst infrastructure is one key element to encourage greater uptake of walking and cycling, it will only get used if it's in the right place and people want to use it. And that's why the Act and its guidance place 
great importance on engaging with people in the planning of these networks. And this means engaging with those already using active travel. They have obviously got great expertise and local knowledge, but possibly more importantly, also with those who don't currently make walking or cycling journeys. And this is much harder, obviously, they're not going to immediately jump on any active travel consultation. But it's essential if you want to get more diverse groups walking in, uh, groups of people walking and cycling. And we encourage the use of very engaging face-to-face -face methods to achieve this. But other methods, such as online consultations, are really effective too. And of course, over the last 15 months, they were absolutely critical to be able to get input during the COVID restrictions. So to support our local authorities in their engagement during the current phase of pre uh, preparing these new network plans, we have, <clears throat> we have provided them with the use of the um, commonplace engagement platform, uh, which have been really well received. And there have been tens of thousands of comments across Wales of people um, making suggestions and um, highlighting problems in local networks. And this is now all feeding into the revision of the map that I've mentioned earlier. Arguably the most important enabler um, to achieve greater levels of walking and cycling is of course funding. And um, we have been funding active travel schemes for a long time from a range of capital grants. But um, since 2018, we've made a real breakthrough by having a dedicated active travel fund for these schemes. And this has risen from 10 million in the first year to 70 million this year. And we are hoping it will stay at these levels at least. Um, beyond this, active travel schemes receive funding from a broad range of other, both public and private sources. And increasingly, of course, the cost of active travel infrastructure is incorporated routinely as part of the overall cost of wider schemes rather than treated as an add-on, which is really important. And then complementing such capital investment with complementary programs is really important. And much of our activity in recent years has been focused on schools and um, cycle training, and we are looking to step this up further again. And we're looking, for example, for the wide ranging implementation of school street schemes, as well as exploring the role of school travel plans afresh and, um, and the sort of associated interventions that can support these matters. But we're also looking to expand the range of promotion and behavior change activities much more in the future. And for example, um, one of the key areas that we want to um, refresh is um, adult cycle training. At the moment, it is quite a small part of the cycle training that is happening, but um, we really want to see an increase in this. And um, we're also starting a range of um, innovative new schemes such as uh, e-bike loan pilots, which are taking par part, particularly in some of the more deprived areas in Wales, to see what potential impact making access to e-bikes easier can have on, on people's ability to, to make active travel journeys. So finally, then, um, I think it's really important to highlight that because of the far reaching benefits of walking and cycling, which are now luckily are widely recognized, um, it is now supported by a lot of other policy areas and sectors. And um, it is recognized that it can achieve, help achieve those um, sectors, um, their, uh, help them achieve their goals as well. So, for example, the planning system in Wales is now geared around the sustainable travel hierarchy <clears throat> and puts placemaking uh, place principles at its heart. And so it fully complements the transport policy. And colleagues working on public health, on air quality, and decarbonisation all want to achieve similar aims and increase levels of walking and cycling and support these. And so the conditions to make progress really have never been better. So I'm now handing over to my colleague Ian Bradfield, who will highlight another key policy area that we are pursuing to make the places where people live much more focused on their needs and less dominated by motor traffic. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, 
My name is Ian Bradfield. I'm the uh, Principal Policy Lead for Roads uh, with Welsh Government. Uh, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about uh, the 20 mile an hour default speed limit in Wales. Um, this is something that's been around for a bit now. Um, a default residential speed limit of 20 mile an hour was a commitment of the First Minister, uh, First Minister Manus Festo, um, back in um, 2019. He made this statement to the Senate saying, we know 20 mile an hour zones uh, reduce speed, the speed of traffic and reduce accidents, particularly accidents to children. And we want to see that become the default right across Wales. So after he, after he did this, um, he then got the deputy minister uh, well, for transport and he's now the minister for climate change, Lee Waters, <coughs> um, to set up a task force group. Uh, in last year, they published their report making recommendations as to what needs to be done to change the default speed limits on restricted roads in Wales. I'll just explain restricted roads are those with lighting columns on. So any road by default where lighting columns are a certain distance apart are 30 mile an hour. But what will happen when the legislation comes in, any road with lighting columns again will go down to 20 miles an hour. Um, the task force group um, was set up to look at the practical actions that were needed and what needed to be do, done to actually change the law. Now, the Welsh Government accepted the, the response, all the recommendations and published their response, the 21 recommendations. Uh, and then they put this to the vote in the Senate. And as you can see, they got a pretty good support. 45 out of 53 Senate members said they were in favour uh, to support the Welsh Government's intention commence the process. Now, the current government, one of its five year priorities set out in the Wales Transport Strategy is to change the default speed limit from 30 to 20 in built up areas and reduce the traffic related injuries and fatalities and make walking and cycling safer and more attractive. Since the Senate elections in May, the Welsh Government have now published their programme for government which includes 20 mile an hour on all residential roads, and this will form part of the future legislative programme. Now, there's a sort of case for change. Well, 2018, which is really the um, last year for sort of stats, because obviously 2019 with COVID really isn't a, a um, sort of realistic picture. Um, then there were the personal, personal injury collisions uh, where four, which 1,137 were killed or seriously injured, and 80 of these were children. Um, the largest proportion of these serious and fatal, injury, fatal injuries um, actually occurred on roads with a 30 mile an hour speed limit. It's well known that even a small reduction in speed leads to massive casualty savings. Research done a long time ago by the Transport Research Laboratory showed that just a one drop um, of mile an hour in speed limit led to a 60%, so 6 reduction in casualties. Um, the traditional approach to, so it has, to road safety has been to focus on casualty reductions. And obviously 20 mile an hour is going to, as I just been, uh, explained, going to be an important part of this. But, there's also a thing that we want to sort of, with 20 mile an hour, change the perception of road danger. And whether this is, you know, real or perceived, it will encourage active travel, a healthy society, and will be a, sort of a key in delivering the aspirations set out in the Welsh Government, Government's Wellbeing and Future Generations Act. The challenge is the change in uh, the default speed limit from 20 to 30 mile an hour as I say, will hopefully make walking and cycling the most natural way of getting around. And, you know, hopefully there'll be more social interaction with people, more friendships made, more well-being, and of course, this ultimately ends up with sort of better health and people hopefully living longer. Now, this next slide um, shows here that for years the Welsh Government has so given grants to local authority to, to have 20 mile an hour zones. And 
20 mile an hour, as you can see here, only forms a very, very small part of the road network. In fact, this diagram is only for 20, 30, and 40 mile an hour speed limit roads. And this only represents 43% of the overall um, 34,572 kilometres of roads in Wales. So you can just see what a very, very small proportion at the moment 20 mile an hour uh, speed limit roads are. Now, um, 20 mile an hour pilot settlements have been uh, set up prior to uh, the hopeful national rollout. Um, and the Welsh, Welsh uh, 20 mile an hour task force group report that I mentioned set out um, a list of desired outcomes. And these have since been reviewed and refined into core objectives that are going to be assessed in these trial settlements. The three objectives are to reduce injuries on the road network, uh, encourage the change in travel behaviour where people can be more confident and safe and secure enough to use active travel modes and improve the environment of local communities by reducing the ne negative impacts associated with vehicles. Now <clears throat> this map shows the eight uh, first phase, phase implementation pilot settlements. Uh, as you can see, there's a spread. Well, unfortunately, we didn't get that many applications from local authorities in North Wales. It would have been nice to have more. There is a spread, however, of the type of settlements. And the two highlighted here, St Bride's Major and St Dogwood, are already up and running and have already got 20 mile an hour. Now, <clears throat> I need to mention a little bit about the communications. Now, the pilots. Uh, will also be used um, to help develop a communi communication strategy for the actual national rollout. And this is going to be very much focused on a behavioural change and building on a social unacceptability of speeding in residential areas and en encouraging a social responsibility for driving carefully. Now, it is proposed that it won't be on this whole scare tactics as shown here with injuries, but build on a new collective understanding that it's something positive for the community. Now, um, it is proposed to lay, the, as I say, the legislation uh, before the Senate to change the speed limit. Um, and we're hoping for this to come into force in 2023. This will hopefully, this time between now and then will allow for sort of behavioural change campaign to take place and time for people to be sort of adapt to the change. I mean, this is a sort of once in a generation change. So people will take time to actually get used to the idea of not driving 30 and driving 20 on most uh, roads that have street lighting. It also allows a bit of time for local authorities to consult uh, and prepare traffic orders for those roads that remain 30 by an exceptions process where there are roads with little or no pedestrian activity we know there are some dual carriageways with, for example, with 30 mile an hour, and it would be a bit daft if they went down to 20. Um, we've also got to resolve border issues with England. <laughs> I mean, some towns uh, will have streets where there'll be 20 and 30, so we need to try and get consistency with, with England. Um, we want to trial the enforcement strategy, which the police and Go Safe have, have developed. Make all the necessary sign changes. So you can imagine there are absolutely thousands of signs to take down and thousands of signs to put up. And we've also got to make changes to the highway code, and the DVSA have also got to make changes to the driving test. Now, I mentioned a little bit about the exceptions process, uh, and this is going to be refined through the pilot settlements. Now, uh, exempt are lit roads with 40 mile an hour or higher. So any road that's got an existing 40 mile an hour speed limit is not part of this. We've got a, a separate um, document we're doing, which is setting local um, local speed limits in Wales, which are for higher speed roads. Um, now, 20 mile an hour, will, as I say, will not be appropriate in all restricted roads. And Transport for Wales have produced these draft speed limit maps. Now, these are going to be given to the local authorities so they can consult um, with the communities and make the necessary traffic regulation orders to remain 30 mile an hour. As I said, <coughs> by virtue of street lighting, the roads will go to 20. So they'll actually have to make a thing called a traffic regulation order 
to actually put a 30 mile an hour or retain the existing 30 mile an hour that's on the road. That's the sort of reverse of what happens now. So where you want a 20 now, obviously you put an order to put a 20 in on a road that would normally be 30. Now, as I said, um, there's going to be an enforcement uh, with, with, with um, 20 mile an hour. And it's hoped really by getting communities involved, engaging fleet operators to get their drivers to adhere to uh, the speed limits. And these will also hopefully to some extent act as pace vehicles. So obviously if you've got your buses and your fleet operators, you know, local authority vehicles, if they, for example, are, are driving at 20 mile an hour, well, it sort of starts to make it a bit more normal and the traffic caught up in that. Obviously you also have to drive there. Now, um, Transport for London have already done this. Um, they've uh, got their bus operators to be fitted with sort of speed limiters or what's called intelligent speed assist to the new vehicles. Uh, and that means that their vehicles will adhere to the speed limit and the driver actually has to override the system um, if, you know, if otherwise the, the vehicle will, will, will not go over go the speed limit. Now this is going to be fitted to all new vehicles from 2022. Uh, but in the meantime, obviously it'll be a long time before this is the standard. So it, it's important that the public perceives that there's um, enforcement's taking place. So as I mentioned, the police and Go Safety, Road Safety Camera Partnership will be taking part in the, in the pilots and enforcing 20 mile an hour. And on the national rollout, 20 mile an hour will be enforced. Now, to sum up, the uh, key steps are obviously to commence the pilot settlements, which we've just started to do. We need to pass the statutory instrument in the Senate. Now, we won't know exactly when that is. Hopefully it will be in the first year of the legislative programme. So that will be sometime this autumn or next winter spring. Um, we need to have an extensive communications campaign to get people to understand what the difference is. And then, as I say, the when the statutory instruments or what, you know, is, is the legislation comes into force in April 2023, 20 mile an hour will become the new national speed limit in Wales. Thank you very much. I hope you found that interesting. Uh, my name is Ian Bradfield. My contact details are at the bottom there, uh, along with my colleague, Natalie Groman. If you have any queries or anything, please feel free to email us. And I'll try to answer any questions you have. Thank you.